<laughs> it is. I I am envious. I have I have thought about picking up a Mac because they're reasonably priced for an insane amount of power that they've got. A cost efficient uh, Apple's going to be cost efficient now. No, well, they're just course. doing it right now to get you into their platform. I'm sure very quickly. All you have to do is look at the iPad Pro. I, I think you can you can get up to twenty seven hundred dollars before you're done tricking that out the i the tablet. <laughs> but I am looking at the iPad Pro. Yeah. I'm going to on Thursday to look at. It. Oh well, I don't have I don't have it in the lineup. Hi, Judy. Um, but I did just read an article about where they're screwing up with the iPad Pro, and and how this one reviewer would not recommend recommend it at its price point. And it's not because of the hardware; it's because they his his big frustration is not allowing the desktop operating system on it, which handicaps it. Is being a um, cost efficient, uh, uh, professional's cost efficient now? Um, no, just uh, platform right now for development. Platform. I'm sure and right. so if you're going to spend that kind of money, you can get a much better developmental platform that's more open, easier to use for what, for what your goals are. However, it does not talk to all my other Apple devices, so I would not do that. I like well, them all to talk to each other. Yeah. Well, and one of the things, I mean, this might have something, and again, I wasn't ready to talk about this. I was just reading about this, but they, he was doing performance comparisons between the M1 MacBook running OS X, or Mac OS is what we call it now, Mac OS, and the iPad Pro running iOS 15. And so it... Are you, the MacBook Pro with an M1. So, but so if you're following what I'm saying, is that both platforms have this new M1 chip. Oh, yeah. The only difference really should be the software that's running on it. And what he found was some performance uh, hurdles that were they were being handicapped in software because it was having to run iOS 15, and it had to do with how quickly you could transfer data in and out of it and compatibility with with devices that are supposed to be because of their hardware standard compatible but in the end weren't working correctly on the iPad Pro and there's nothing left as a reason except that that uh, uh, it's using a different operating system I'm sorry I got a little distracted I just realized I had a monitor running of uh, the YouTube feed, which I turned on by just moments ago, and it was playing the audio in the background. I couldn't figure out where it was coming from, but it was actually coming from this screen over here, as it was why as it was playing our our broadcast. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can see that. Right now. <laughs> Too many gadgets. Too many actually, gadgets. Actually, you had, things I had a lot of feedback. I thought it was me that with the feedback, but maybe that's what it was. I I was totally thinking it was you, Judy, and then I realized it was I mean, me. It's my fault. <laughs> I'm well, also welcome. Looking, this is the San Carlos Computer Club. I am Scott Stimson from International Computer Solutions. This is how our regular Tuesday meetings go. And I have gone from, should I jinx it again? I've gone from everything not working to everything working again. <laughs> Maybe my problem has to do with flaky internet because I felt like I've had flaky in internet recently. So I got, I've got to go at 11.30 my time. But I wanted to let you all know that I bought a Simply Safe security system at Sam's the other day. Oh my. And so now okay. I took it out of the box, I looked at it, I put it back in the box, so that's on my agenda to do before my, my time to return it if I don't like it runs out. Simply safe, all right. Yeah. How so much we'll time do you have to return it? It was, it, it was you know, one of them said 90 days, so I figure I can get it together in 90 days. <laughs> where where did you pick it up? Did you see it was at Costco? Sam's Club? Sam's. Mm -hmm. well, and it's got like a 
It's got a little camera. It's got a keypad. It's got a fob to lock the doors or arm the system. It's got four window sensors. It's got like a panic alarm something. But the window sensors, I don't know whether they're going to work because all my windows are casement windows, and I can't quite figure out how the little magnets are going to know that they're closed on a casement window. I'm, I'm not even sure what a casement window is. What is that? Well, let's see here. Turn this around. Okay, can you see the window? I so it's sort of swinging door stuff. Yeah, okay, so it it cranks open and it cranks shut. Oh, okay. So, so it's not an up and down window. It's a crank out, crank in. That's that's typical of Anderson. Yes, it is an Anderson. <laughs> actually, actually. So I, I Has think anybody that those, put those um, window sensors are, are when the window seal is broken or when the glass is broken? Uh, the this seal is, is broken. If the window is opened and there's, I got like two, four for doors and a couple for windows that came in this kit. So if the door isn't showing closed, it will, it, it'll send an alert but I'm not going to sign up for a professional monitoring. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Well, as you've been talking, I've been trying to bring up safely yeah, good, safety good luck, good luck with that. I've got the website. So, uh, those, yeah. those door sensors would probably work on your type of window. Okay. Yes, S-I-M-P-L-I -I safe. It seems like if you if you can hear me okay, I. it, it seems like all you're really doing is you're breaking that connection. Moving. No, you can't hear me? Oops, you're good. See, I did Every it again. I jinxed word. myself. I jinxed myself again. Oh, I think I see. But yeah, but it came in. Uh... Testing one, two. Oh, what's that? That's the box. This is my. This is the box. Oh, Wherever awesome. it is, there, there. Comes oh, in this little cool. box. So we'll see. Well, we can't wait to get an update from you. I hope everybody can yeah, hear me. I, I think I might have sorted out my problem. If you guys so can my hear other me. thing was when I'm looking at the iPad, I'm also going to I really am going to get a new iPhone. So we'll see if I decide to do the iPhone Pro X or the iPhone Pro. The iPhone eleven. Uh, Did the twelve uh, was the twelve release? No, 12. twelve. Yeah. Twelve. And so your Pro Max or Pro is your question. And the Pro Max exactly. is the one with the bigger screen. Yes. And somebody told me that it had a better battery, but when I look it up, I can't tell that there's a difference. Unless I was doing videos, which I'm not, so. Yeah, and I think the battery is bigger because the phone is bigger. And so I think <laughs> that's what they refer to when they talk about it having a better battery, is it's just okay. bigger because it can physically be bigger. So we'll see. I don't know if I can handle that big of a phone. You know, that's just kind of like really big. Yeah, that's that's like a mini tablet. Yeah, really big. So yeah. we'll see. Well, and they still, aren't they still selling the SE? That one would fit in a pocket. <laughs> I, I used to have an SE. Right now I have an, a 10. I'm still really attracted to the idea of getting one of these big, almost mini tablets and then having the iWatch just be my phone. And and whenever I need a bigger screen, I would just go get it out of the car. Otherwise, I'd make phone calls through, the, through my watch. I just can't I the stand idea. the idea of wearing a 
a watch again. I I hope I never have to wear a watch again. Is that your Dick Tracy watch? That's that's what what I live for is the Dick Tracy watch. Is that I, I want to be able to go running on the beach without taking my phone with me, but deal with the phone if I have to. The watch has got to have music and GPS. It's got to do all the jobs that the phone's doing. So I can. And so the only thing I want the phone for is when I want a big screen to look at. Cheryl, he didn't. Say that again, Fred. Cheryl asked if you did the intro, and I said, no, you had not. No, I started falling apart when I did the intro. <laughs> I can try again. This is the San Carlos Computer Club. I'm Scott Stimson from International Computer Solutions here to answer questions and banter on tech topics for today. Uh, so far, the morning has been plagued with typical club problems from my end. I think I, I think I might have sorted it out. I think my Ethernet adapter has gone bad. I've switched everything over to my Wi-Fi connection, and everything seems to be poppy and and working now. We'll see throughout the rest. But if that if that plug's gone bad, I got to replace it. So I am here. I don't like the way the camera. It looks. This is not a stained shirt. There's some shadow on me. <laughs> Honestly, I I show up in clean clothes. I do. <laughs> sure. Yeah, shower whether I need it or not. <laughs> Is my video camera working? Uh, Chester, not... I don't see you. Well, it must not be working. I'm going to go offline and come back on, see if it works. Okay. So I did send out a document of links last night. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to look at it, but that was my topics for the day. And uh, anything that jumps out that people are interested in talking about. I'm very happy to talk about. That's the wrong monitor. But the document looks like this, possible topics. And at the bottom, I've just dropped a picture that, that Paul was bringing up. Can you guys see that okay? This is five megabytes of memory back in the day. When was that, Paul? Did you, did you catch the year? Um. I'm bringing up your email at the same time right now. Five megabyte hard drive being loaded into a truck for delivery in 1966. Five megabytes of memory in 1966. So that gives you an idea of how little memory went to space. Well, that goes with the picture that I sent you uh, one time of uh, one megabyte hard drive that was the size of a washing machine. <laughs> yeah. I was so repairing computers impressive. back in the 60s or back in the 80s and I remember that the 80 megabyte drives were uh uh 300 pounds. Whoa. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, I I lived oh. in North Bay in the 60s and and uh, in the early 60s, like um, 64, they took me down into the a bunker in the ground and they showed me the, uh, the computers they were using to track every plane in the air in North America. And it was the size of our school gymnasium. Yeah. Well, I don't have any stories to go back that far, but <laughs> I did used to work for Department of Natural Resources in the Division of Oil and Gas in Alaska. And one of the things that really stuck with me was that there was the computer room where the servers are. And the computer room was all servers. It was it was like the floor was air conditioned and wires all below. I'm sure you've you've seen that throughout your lives, the computer labs. And and a huge monster monster of a machine lining two walls of this room, as well as huge computers in the middle of it, just things that you expect to see in the movie Metropolis, right? I mean, just out of control, huge devices. And they were all churned down. None of them were running. And on top of them were these little white beige boxes 
And the beige boxes is what we were using. I was doing my internship, and those were the servers that the department was using. And they were just sitting on top of these monstrous computers that were literally so big they wouldn't pay to have them removed from the room. And so they were just fixtures in the room. That's like having your working TV sitting on top of your old TV. That's exactly what it was like, Paul. This is exactly it. <laughs> I can give you a couple real antique items. The first computer I ever worked on in programming was in college. It was a copy of the University of Illinois' ILLIAC. It had 1K of memory stored on a CRT. The input-output was paper tape. And of course, unlike a card reader, you couldn't insert a card in the middle in paper tape. You had to rekey it all. Well, of course, the biggest mistake you would make was accidentally stepping on your long paper tape while it's feeding, which would, of course, oh. <laughs> which was funny. The other one was in my first train with IBM. They had this the largest computer IBM made that we were using for multiple people all doing compiles of their COBOL program. Well, I misspelled the word computer in source computer is. It brought down the entire machine because nobody ever thought that somebody could be so dumb in programming <laughs> that they couldn't spell computer. <laughs> Well done, David. Well yeah. done. That's yeah. great. Yeah, I can give you lots of funny things. Like the first, the RAM Act disk drive, the big old thing. Um, the way you did error recovery is you just repeated the command to try and read the disk. And since the R, there was only one arm, and it had to go up and down and then in to find the, the track to read. Well, if you couldn't read it, the arm would retract back to home, go up, come back down, and then come in. Well, you could hear the thing going click, click, click. Oops, I failed. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, and it would, can it, what, doesn't it still just continue to try and read? Well, they <laughs> try, you know, they try to do reads. They do usually, you know, you've got, the redundancy always of the disk drives too these days. Yeah, um, I was just thinking that that redundancy is 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 just the way we deal with those kinds of problems. If you ever spend any time working with Windows services, one of the options is just try again. And there's some number of try agains that you can set, or it can just infinitely try again. Well, they do try a fair number of times, and then they'll try a different method, and and that's even on. You know, people use RAID 5 quite a bit, which is where you have a group of disk drives all kind of uh, in combination where if anyone failed, the other three or four could recreate it. Or then they switched more to RAID 1, which is basically mirroring of everything. So for every time you do a write one spot, you do one the other spot. And the better computers at that point in time would keep track of where the arm was physically on the disk drive and literally choose which one of the mirrored drives to write to, knowing that it would be much faster to go to the one drive versus the other drive. Well, cool. I can give you lots of, for my long career with IBM and performance, you know, lots of funny things happen over the years. Well, Dave, maybe we should work out some questions for you. It would be interesting to hear some of IBM's history. Were you there when they were working on the PowerPC? Uh, I bought one of the first ones. At the employee price, it was $7,000 by the time you included all the software. It had a rip roaring more memory than most that people would buy. It had um, two floppy disk drives, you know, the five and a quarter, as I remember. Um, what OS know, did you run on it? I see you're running Microsoft DOS or IBM DOS. Well, don't forget, you're talking about the major screw up in my mind that IBM ever made. They contracted with Microsoft to basically write their operating system 
but the contract read that Microsoft retained ownership of it. And thus, IBM basically set them up totally as a business. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. That made Bill Gates. Boy, didn't yeah. that make the most ironic part of that is my son, you know, he decided he was going to write a program. I think he was probably, let me think, when I got that, he was probably about seven. <laughs> and he decided he was going to do a motorcycle jumping over things and rotate it. Well, doing graphics in elementary basic was far more complex than anyone thought. And so I was extremely impressed that both he and his good friend today still vividly remember going through that exercise and how they wound up basically because of that computer with a lifelong service of it. Now, the interesting thing also is how I got this computer. Um, I had a customer, um, Husky Oil, who probably had the best geological person I ever knew. I would have bought anything he said to buy as far as oil speculation instantly because he used graphics and multi-layers to draw things and map it to figure out where things were. Well, the company kind of changed what they're doing and they still had their computer, which they paid like 150,000 for. And they still owed, I think, 30 or 40,000. Well, I bought this computer for 1,500 bucks and all 5,000 pounds of it or whatever it was, and had it into my basement. Of course, the truck who delivered it was on like a 15 degree slope and he's going, don't ever call us to get this thing back in because we don't know any way we could possibly do it. We can drop it off your, the trail gate with doing what it was the, computer? the basement. The, well, your, do you remember? Hmm? It's 1130, you remember? so we're talking was eight, late, when was the PC out? Late 80s? Late 90s. Anyway, can't remember exactly the year. What happened was, you know, I rewired the power supply uh, that drove the disk drive to run on single phase power because it was wired to three fires. I just basically put some huge capacitors across it to stabilize the voltage. Sold the key punch for 1500 bucks because that's what I paid for the computer, so I'm, now I'm even. <laughs> uh, one of the big problems was the dog would come running up and the main computer unit looked like a desk with a low keyboard and the window was behind it and the dog would jump on top of the computer on the keyboard and put his paws on the window to look out. That was always fun. Hey, Dave, what you're describing sounds like what we used to call a mini computer, is that correct? It competed with DEC, it was purely a scientific. Now. The rest of this is a year later, a guy called me up and said, I'll give you 7,000 bucks for this computer. And I'm going, that's a weird number, why? And he said, well, I said, you know, you can have it, but you know, I'm not sure how the hell you're gonna get it out of here. And then what I came to find out was this, he was using the same computer at a service bureau paying 7,000 a month to run a specific program that was free on my computer that I had. And this program is called oh, Plan. Wow. Problem Language it, Analyzer. It was a- Problem Language Analyzer, PLM? A, yes, PLAN. It was developed by IBM, never announced and sold for a long time. And it was used as a vehicle to write other programs. And so it was kind of object-oriented where you put all sorts of pieces together with at runtime. And I actually developed my color matching program using it uh, for the company. And we basically would give it a command and you could do things like change what I would call a pop-up stack of what executes next. And what executes next would be, oh, I got something big enough, I got to flush all my memory, do something totally different and come back and restart. It was very sophisticated, but very cheap. Also, thus I sold that computer and that's where the seven grand came for, to buy my IBM PC. <laughs> Great story, Dave. David. Thank you, Dave. David, I think my first computer 
was called an 8088. Uh, one of the first desktops, I believe, that came out. Did, did you have background on that computer? No, I was working with the bigger IBM stuff. That's a PC chip, the 8088. Yeah. So that was actually the first PC, computer. wasn't it? The first IBM PC was an 8088. Mm -hmm. and, and you actually have to blame the 8088 for where we are right now with PCs because it's been the same architecture all along. It just It keeps getting extended and sped up and bigger, bigger registries and bigger caches of memory. But the the instru it's kind of like the way um, English has, has has evolved as a language. The 8088 chipset has evolved with time. Yeah. To you know, we're still using even though there's there well, and that's this M1. We we keep talking about the new Apple stuff. The new Apple stuff is a complete rewrite of that that kind of architecture, and and so it's been written in a more modern time than the 8088. We're mm -hmm. kind of pulling out of a legacy of it, a good i i think a good uh, analogy is muscle cars versus electric cars because we were in a world of heat and power and now we're in a world of finesse it's <laughs> storage capacity yeah that chip and it's all the successors up until today still have the same basic problems they don't have a good vehicle for locking so you can't lock something that basically says from the system itself that it says it's already in use, don't have a second person run it. You're talking about the, the 86 architecture. Yeah. Or I thought that was I thought that was um power PC that was behaving like that. Well the, uh, the uh, preemptive multitasking is what it sounds like you're describing. The power PC is basically the same chipset as the what um, is now called I series was called AS four hundred was the System thirty eight architecture all under the covers. These, it, was, it was a RISC architecture similar to the ARM architecture we well, use now, right? That same computer runs two totally different operating systems of the power PC or the I series. It's physically the same hardware marketed totally different um with a different with, operating system yeah with just basically a different operating system forcing the computer to run differently i'm just looking at old computer pictures on my screen it wasn't wasn't one of the old mainframes na uh, named a 360 <laughs> yeah 360s were announced actually I went to work for IBM went, and then went in the service and they paid for my time, you know, and all this. But um, that was announced when I was overseas and they said, yeah, this is the best thing since sliced bread, but they forgot to say even remotely, is this a computer or what is it? And the whole 360 architecture is still in use today, you know, by a lot of major companies because there was so much software that they've never been able to reprogram it. The System 38 was originally an architecture designed to replace the entire 360, 370, mainframe, whatever you want to call it, line of computers. And they did that because the government was trying to break up the company into three parts, the typewriter, the small computer, and the large computer. Well, the large computer people realized the cost and complexity of the software was such that they could never bring it to market so the small computer part of IBM picked it up as the architecture of the 38 I series, et cetera, which is still out there today, be expecting the government to break up IBM and thus they had a competitor to what was the big IBM computer from the small IBM computer division, which they thought would be two different companies. Very interesting. If you're looking at my screen, I put up a picture of what I think you're talking about, Dave. That's a 360. Wow. If you look for an 1130, that was the one I had in my basement with its, well, five foot high, three foot wide, probably four foot long. That was just the 
attachment to allow you to attach disk drives and uh, printer. So at this picture that we're looking at right now, what we're seeing is the computer and the input device and the, and the output device. Instead of a screen, keyboard, and a mouse, you've got a typewriter. That's and, then the, the and then the storage is off frame, right? The storage is sitting to the right of it. The storage units would be about three foot by three foot by three foot each one, um, sitting in a bank of many, like the United Airlines main center in Denver was a whole room full of those. It was constantly, the repair guy would rebuild them constantly going up and down one aisle. And by the time he finished, he'd start again. At the IBM center in Boulder, which is one of the three worldwide communications centers, was most interesting because it was a three-story building. And they put the computers on the, let me think, second floor. They put the disk drives that you'd never get to on the third floor. And they put the stuff that people would handle, mostly tape drives and consoles and stuff like that on the first floor. So they stacked it all vertically. The room was probably 100 yards square and three stories of it and totally filled with all these computers. Why would they spread them apart like that, Dave? Do you have an idea? Um, to minimize cable lengths. Because going, combined with what from... the, the operators would go between computers doing things like changing tapes. So they put all the tape stuff that the people had to deal with on the first floor. They put the stuff that you didn't have to deal with too much on the top floor and the stuff you went to occasionally on the second floor. Wow. wow. But because computer speeds are based on speed of light, you had to minimize the cable distances. Sure, sure. So, so you were saying it's more direct moving between the floors. With the than cable, moving if you were going to spread them and yet have the operators still have convenience to work on everything. Otherwise, yeah. the operators had to run around like mad. I can't help but imagine there's also devices such as storage that probably, like you were saying earlier, needed constant maintenance. And it'd be better to have that apart from other things that didn't need that kind of attention all the time. It could just sit and run. And this drives in a com very computer intense. Airline bookings was one of the most computer intense. Um, for the number of disk seeks done per transaction. And those were rebuilt constantly. Nearly destroyed idea. Hmm. That might be an interesting article. Uh -huh. Hang on to that. It was a very interesting company because you wouldn't, you know, both how they marketed and treated people for things like I got trained in a lot as a technician on a salary. I went to classes on basically marketing techniques. We so could sit there and listen and watch people. We, well, now they're doing this and kind of funny, but it was a lot of it was uh, motivating people. Um, they even sent me to a one week class term titled stress management and data processing. Just basically saying, don't jump into things, relax and think through, take a break and you'll probably be far more efficient. <laughs> that is good advice. Now, oh, my test absolutely. questions, the ones I repeat to most people are, one of my, I handled, with the smaller computer end of IBM, I handled most of the oil companies, the ski areas and stuff out of Denver. Well, since I had the programming background, I also had the Denver Bronco football team as a customer. And you would think they would be using the computer there for accounting, but that's not true because they always sold out tickets yearly. So once a year they had to print tickets, big deal. That's not much of an application. They used the computer because it had a built-in database 
And whenever things change from the coaching side, they could change it much easier because of the built-in database and the hardware. Well, thus I wound up, you know, where they said, ah, could you come help us up in the press box during the games? You know, our programs are written by this contractor of a college and they're a piece of junk. So in case we had to fix stuff on the fly during the football games, I wound up helping to keep statistics for the team. And therefore, I have my favorite couple of questions about football that nobody knows the answers to. Like, what always happens statistically when the offense makes a touchdown in addition to what you think of like it was a pass completed, it was a run done, etc. And I'll take bets. Nobody can tell you hear it all the time and you have no clue that the statistic got logged of what happened. I I gotta I gotta admit, I'm not even following, probably because I don't follow football. I'm not certain that ah, okay. what, what you're what, what but I'm 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 anxious for an answer, even though I don't understand the question. <laughs> Same here. It is, it's always a first down completed. Because you may not think of it might be a long run or pass. Well, they get the first down, which gives them the opportunity to do the point after. Likewise, okay. the other trick question is if it's a kickoff and the ball goes more than 10 yards but does not go 15 yards, officially that was not a football play. It was a loose ball change of yardage, loose ball change of possession. And the reason for this, you wouldn't want to penalize the kicker on his average distance kicking off which would affect his salary at the end of the season. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, from, you know, acting as basically a consultant for probably a thousand different companies over the years, you learn a lot of ins and outs about business and how it works. You know, you'd have um, the owner of the business, I dealt with the smaller ones, they would tell you their five-year plan that no employee would know, but they wanted to make sure they would to do up with the computer. <laughs> or like right. the warehouses, like Costco and Pace, and which was one of their founders. You know, I knew how they made money. The employees did. And it's still true today. One of their big money makers, it's now changed. It used to be they would demand, we want toothpaste. We don't care what brand, we don't care what size, we want it to cost about this, and we won't pay for it for 21 days at, until after it's received. And the reason for that is the float of the money. They, they're earning interest for that until it sells, which is only a few days for the rest of that 21 days. What's true today, it's, it's now down to 15 days, but the float is one of the major profit makers for a warehouse. That's very interesting. Um, I'm appreciating all of Dave's topics. This is great history and I find it fascinating, but I do feel like we should probably open up to other topics for our meeting. Is there any other topics people have that they'd like to bring into the meeting? I, I or, have one. Yeah, Chester, what do you got? Well, it, it's not something I did, it's something a friend did for me. Uh, he, con he connected my laptop to my 65-inch TV, and uh, that's fun. Because you've got all kinds of stuff on your computer that is not accessible to the TV, but now it is. If it, I, I'm having fun with it. So are you using an HDMI cable to connect to your laptop? No, it's all, it's all uh, Internet. It's all... Uh, um, wireless. Wireless. Well, that's a that's a great way to go. Hey, are you doing it through your smart screen, or did you have a uh, streaming stick like a Roku or um, Fire Stick? You're doing it. No, through? it's it's actually set up in the computer, and I'm not quite sure which program he installed or, or how he did it. But of course, all I know now is how to make the connection. And sure. There's no wires or anything. It's just in the laptop, you go to display uh, settings and you click on the TV. 
That's that's right. In, in, in we're talking about Windows 10. This is how Windows 10 has been behaving, is that it allows you to cast wirelessly to I think the language is wireless display. And so you 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 hit the the Windows key P and it brings up the different displays you can be connected to. Is is that what you're doing there, Chester? Yes. And it also brings over the sound, which is nice. Yeah, yeah, it's a very cool feature to have available. And some TVs, a lot of TVs now have it built in. It's a system called Mircast that that uh, Windows uses. There's a couple of other systems as well that are compatible with Mircast, and they've got their own brand name for it. I know I've been very successful on Samsung TVs because it's got this mirroring feature in there, and Windows 10 will support it. And so you can... It needs to be discovered on your computer by Windows 10 as a device. But then after it's already been discovered, it is as easy as changing the display over. Well, this is an LG 65-inch. Okay. So that's that's great. Scott, repeat what you just said about how you go into settings and then what? Well... Okay, so your TV has to be found as a device for it to be an option. Right. So if you go into devices, you should have your TV there. If not, you're going to need to add it in whatever whatever manner it needs to be added. Typically, it's really easy, though. It should be found out on the internet on the same network that you're on. So when you're when you're adding devices, in fact, I'm kind of bringing it up right now on my thing here. Let me see. When you're adding devices. Here we go. It's going through, finding the... Here's other devices I'm not connected to. Here's my TV set. I named it Yarvin 4. I have a real Star Wars theme going on in my house. And so when this is connected, it's not connected right now, but it, it is known as a device, then I can go to uh, the Windows key and press P, and you see this is opened up. P stands for project. So I could do, I've got three monitors hooked up right now. That's why you're seeing that I can do just the PC or I could duplicate or I could extend or I could choose just the second screen. And at the bottom, it says connect to a wireless display. And so what, when you connect to a wireless display, you're setting that up as your secondary monitor. And then you can just use the command P to move between the two. I'm sorry, the, the Windows key, P, to move between the two. I can't connect to my display right now because my display needs to be in a mode for it to be compatible with, with my system. With my particular TV, I need to switch it over to its mirror function, kind of like another input. So it could be HDMI 1, HDMI 2, it could be VGA. In this case, it's mirror sharing that my, my Samsung needs to be switched over to for me to be able to make a connection to the TV from my, from my computer. I, I think I just exhausted all the information I have on Chester's topic. Right. <laughs> <laughs> my, my own personal experience. Oh, I, I guess I got one other thing. We had talked a couple weeks ago about my experience using my phone as a um, a video source, when we were staying in a hotel there in Magdalena, we wanted to watch a movie, and we didn't have a movie service, but they had provided us with a Roku TV, one of those TCL TVs. And I was able to very easily pick that up on my Android phone and cast Streamio over to that TV set without any real real issues. I guess the only real issue I had is it worked for a second and then I couldn't get it to work at all until I unplugged the TV set, let it sit 10 seconds, plug it back in, and then everything worked from that point on without a problem. So I, I, I think that problem is one of those classic, weird, this device has never used this function before and it froze the first time it tried to do it because of something else. And just unplugging and letting it reset for a second well, in this case, specifically 10 seconds. And then plugging it back in resolved whatever conflict it had. 
and it just continued to work from that point on. And that's the same kind of wireless display technology, just accessed from a mobile device instead of a laptop. I thought that was a very cool way to travel. I typically carry the uh, an Amazon TV box, or not an Amazon TV box, a streaming box. I, I typically carry one of those knockoff Chinese streaming boxes, an Android TV streaming box. That was the terminology I was trying to say. The Android streaming box needs to be set up with a cable. It's very easy. You plug it into whatever TV you have in front of you. You have a remote control. Uh, however, for not having that equipment with me, if you, there is a TV in front of you, which more likely than not these days, you are going to be in, uh, using a TV that has this wireless streaming capability, then just having a mediocre phone, because that's all mine is, is a mediocre phone, running your Netflix or your Streamio or whatever service, Disney Plus, and casting it over the TV, you don't have to hook up any cables if you're trying to watch that one show before going to bed at night. I love Chester's background. You you look like you're in Narnia. I thought those were birds flying, but I think there are leaves falling. Okay. Yeah, I think you're right. Very cool. Well, do we have other topics to bring to Do I have just really good audio? You guys are so quiet. Oh, I guess all the mics are off. Anybody have any other topics they'd like to bring to today's meeting? Cheryl, you're too quiet. Jim's got something. Yeah. You remember a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about that computer I'd wiped out the hard drive on, and you told me about... Uh, uh, oh, yeah, the media creation tool. Yeah. Well, I did that. I downloaded the media creation tool plugged it in, it started to uh, boot up collecting information, but it stopped before it hit the ins installing windows and said I needed, they needed to have a device uh, storage drive. And let me go back and look exactly what they said. Um, yeah, yeah, if you have the language right there. And said off, to install I'm sorry, what? Oh, no, go ahead. If you've got it in front of you, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just was, I, I was going to color while we waited. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. Sorry, Jim. To install the device driver for your drive, insert the installation media containing the driver files and then click OK. Okay, you should never have to do that. Okay, because I don't have an installation media for this computer anymore, I think. So I don't know how to get the. Well, well, and actually, I think that's getting misinterpreted. I think what the message you're seeing is if you have an unusual storage device, like a SCSI device that has its own proprietary drivers that Windows is not aware of, this is the opportunity to put those drivers in to make that device work so that you can install on that particular device. I think that's the message you're being greeted with. Okay. Well, since and 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 so you, this would be something that you would just bypass in a regular install. All right, but it wouldn't let me. I got, went back to the previous screen, and it says, "Where do you want to install Windows?" Okay, yeah. that's where you should be. There are no. And does it show anything in that window? No, nothing. Name, it's total just, size, free space, type, but nothing underneath the uh, head. It's just blank. I'm a, I'm afraid to say that sounds like your hard drive is dead. It sounds like run check check disk if you can. Well, it's not even. It should be announcing the hardware ready to be partitioned at this point in the install. It should it should see your hard drive. It, it, David it hasn't even gotten a chance to have a hard drive problem because it's not seeing the hard drive to begin with. Correct. And and I I'm wondering if this is the underlying failure of your of your computer is that the hard drive is not there anymore. I've had it where the startup stuff on the hard drive wasn't good. And if you take the option where you can get into DOS from something you could boot, 
then you could run check disk, which basically rebuilds how it looks at tracks. Yeah, yeah. And no, does I mean, the recovery, if that, you can get that, there. Yeah, but I was going to say that, the, Dave, that's all really good advice if you can see the hard drive. Because the, well, at the BIOS level, they have to see the hard drive. And at this screen, if I'm remembering this screen correctly, what, what Jim should be presented with is he should see the partitions of Windows 10 that already exist if, if there was problems with them. If there's a problem yeah. with the installation, he should see those partitions. And then you could go on to a process like, like Dave's describing, where you can yeah. check disk them for right. errors. But the but fact that you don't see them in that window, even as non, at the very worst, you should see it, and it should not be able to read the partitions. It should, you should see this clump that is a hard drive, and there's no logic around it, but it should yeah. still be there. But if the partition table is bad, then you can still get to that because you don't have to even read that disk first. If you can get to that screen, uh, no, no, I disagree, Dave. It's supposed to show the hardware at that install. Yeah. You're supposed to you're supposed to be able to see the hard drive, even if the partition's completely chingada. You should be able to see the hard drive at that screen. And again, Jim, you're reporting a blank chingado. window. What's that? Did you really say chingado? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but Jim, again, you're looking at a white window with column headers on it. Correct. And it's empty. And, and are there buttons at the bottom that you can access? Yes, there is a refresh button. And to the right of that, there is a delete button, a format button, and a new button. Okay, I'm imagining that those following three buttons are like low lighted, like you can't use them. Absolutely correct. And then the, the okay. first button, the refresh, you can use. And if you hit it, does anything appear in the window? The answer is no. Uh, yeah, see, that's where he should be seeing the hardware. And nothing there. Yeah. It says it uh, we couldn't find any drives. To get a storage driver, click load driver. And that's yeah, and so that message is, is confusing because it's not working the way it's supposed to work. That message makes sense to somebody like me who might be working with very foreign equipment. Maybe maybe they've got some really bizarre storage apparatus that they, that's very proprietary. Maybe it's for a machine in a maquila, but Windows wouldn't have that software. You are never in that in that experience. None of us that are sitting at home using Windows 10 has that experience. And so the only reason that you followed that link is because what's supposed to be working isn't. Correct. And I, I'm afraid that what's happened is your internal hard drive, something's gone wrong with it, either the cable to it or it has died. Is it an HP? Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a say, I mean, I, I kid, but it's an easy guess because there's so many HPs out there. Let me ask you, it is an HP. And uh, yeah. by the way, I have a bunch of extra uh, external hard drives. If I attach one of those, would only the most recent of technology would you be able to install on a USB connected drive. Like if it was a USB C drive, you could do it. I'm not certain. I would hope you could do it from a USB three, but I sure haven't done an install like that. And in the BIOS, it would have to be recognizing it as a system available device. See, the problem with the the removable devices is is more than hardware. At first, it was always hardware, but now it becomes a security issue as well. And, and so tr traditionally, Microsoft does not have a way for you to load up your operating system on a removable hard drive. Right. So it was a it was a hardware issue in the in the past, and it's a security issue now. And so it's a number of switches that need to be set correctly and supported for you to be able to do it. It's easier to say you probably can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an easier answer. I mean, there might actually be a way to do it, but, but normal people aren't doing that kind of stuff with their computers.
Gotcha. Well, why don't you think about it? And I'll be down there in September and we can put our heads together. Yeah, I think your next step, if you had somebody like me around, would be to pull out the hard drive and test it in another computer. If I'll you had somebody like... I'll what's that? San Carlos. I don't have another Scott around. Okay, all right. Well, I mean, that's definitely the next road to go down, is take out the hard drive, connect it to another computer, see if you can get any love out of it. If the hard drive works, then it could be that the cable in the computer is a, not not so often a standard problem, but definitely has proven to be a problem in computers that have flat ribbon cables that have a lot of movement and, and they're positioned in a weird way that they will actually wear themselves out. It's a classic MacBook problem. I, I'm thinking, in fact, it's, it's a really strange MacBook problem because the cable is still good for old hard drives, but not new hard drives. It is weird. Yeah. So it, it could be a cable or it could be the hard drive. The hard drive's probably a solid state hard drive. Yes. Yeah. So I'd be more likely to believe it's a cable first. I just see. because I, I, yeah, I, I attribute more reliability to, to the solid state hardware. One, one final question. Sure. It doesn't have to be the final one. Uh, well, it's time to run out. Uh, do you have any comments regarding how to protect ourselves from what's going on extensively and taking over and locking your computer and requiring payment other than backing this, everything up? This ransomware stuff. Ransomware. I actually stuck it at the top of this list, this hackers behind holiday crime spree demand 70 million and say they've locked a million devices. Where, where is this? Right here. This is uh, probably probably the most interesting part of this news is that they don't want us to think that it's news. The, the, um, the um, software that was compromised was uh, their spokesperson has said that uh, they've got the compromise fixed and it's not going to be an issue again. But apparently it flew throughout number of companies in the United States, large companies, and they're attributing it to this group called R Evil. Evil with an R. And they, they want to blame it on a Russian hacking group. And so far, it looks like there's a very good reason for that. Your question, Chester, is how do we protect ourselves? I The only thing we can do is just be good, good computer users and, and use caution we, uh, I am a firm believer that the antivirus stuff that is being used by Microsoft is good enough as long as you have good habits. I think good habits include having backups of the stuff that you're concerned about losing. These ransomwares are not as effective against you and me. They're much more effective against a uh, city government or a hospital. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to jack up your computer, Chester. I, unfortunately, if you didn't have a backup, it's really painful for you. But they couldn't ask you for a lot of money. They'd have to be asking in hundreds of dollars for you to take them seriously. If they're up in the tens of thousands, you'd be like, well, I'm heartbroken, but I'm not giving you that much money. And a corporation or a city government, a police department or a hospital they can afford to just hand over that kind of money because they can't afford to be offline and they need access to that data. I don't know if you remember the, the gas pipeline. They actually paid for the fix, and then they discovered the fix was going to take so long. And this is one of the saddest things about this being used as a, as a new age business model for hackers is that the tool was going to take so long for to recover their data that they just continue to recover from backup because even though they paid for the tool, it, was, it, it wasn't it was going to fix their problem. Now, what they did get was something that their IT people could analyze and learn from and, and show the exploits so that they could be patched and fixed in the future. But that's really, that's more a community issue. Like this, this one particular, the, the gas pipeline, they paid for the tool and then 
released it to the community because they didn't even end up using it. Is they released it to the security community to learn whatever they could from it. Yes, matter if you fact, type, the government got uh, back some of the money. I I don't know any of the nuances of that. Do you, Chester? Do you understand how that? I works? think I think the U.S. government got back. I think three, uh, one and a half million, uh, more more or less, of the three million they paid. But someone recently paid, I believe, I believe twelve million dollars. Yeah, I think that we have businesses. I, it's funny. I, I I listen to the Verge Cast. It's a they're they're they've been a podcast forever, and they talk about technology, and. They're fond. Of, well, one of the things they say all the time is every business is an IT business or every business is a tech business. And I think that's very true in this day and age that we have operations that that are worth twelve million dollars not to be shut down because they're in the end they're a tech business. Everything that makes their thing work is a tech business. You're not worth 12 million to be shut down so they can't ask you for that kind of money chester nor i i'm not i'm not worth hundreds of dollars but what we can do to protect ourselves from the inconvenience of coming across um ransomware uh, would be to make sure we have cloud services make sure we have offline backups and um Factor in the inconvenience of being offline, like Jim is right now with a hardware problem. He there's a factor of inconvenience that he has to add to the cost of a computer that that uh, suffers hardware problems. It's the same thing with this ransomware. Is is you have to fortify yourself with the amount of intolerance that you can handle. So yeah. if you can. If you can afford, like my dad does online classy, classes, he basically looks as a, a computer as a, as a two computer purchase. He's constantly got a backup computer that is almost a mirror. In fact, in the most recent years, this is a beautiful save for him. In the most recent years, uh, he has been using a subscription with Microsoft with the one terabyte of space in the cloud. And I've been synchronizing his desktop and his documents to that one terabyte of space. I've made it very difficult for him to store things outside of those areas. And he can move some stuff to a USB drive, but he knows where it's going. He knows that's not in the cloud space. But everything else that's in his computer is being synchronized. He had some problems with his computer. I don't remember if we talked about it a couple weeks ago. And the tech person from Costco, because he bought a service contract with Costco, convinced him he needed to format the entire computer. And he did that, and then he was at a loss. He didn't have his accounts ready at hand. And when we finally sorted it out, it was awesome because it was just a matter of getting that Microsoft account back into his computer correctly. And then with a re reasonably speed internet connection, all his documents started feeding back into his computer. He didn't have to go to an external hard drive. It just brought everything back exactly as he knew it. Of course, he knows it as Microsoft Office, Windows 10, and every document he's ever created for class. So he was a back up and running with just the account. And so that's the kind of fortification that you want to have when dealing with these kinds of threats, because these threats aren't going to go away. Perhaps at our next meeting, we can talk about syncing our laptops with our desktops. Well, yeah, these, I mean, in this respect, if you're paying for the 360 subscription, I totally think you should be syncing your data up to that terabyte of space and taking advantage of that because they're going to do a better job of of doing backups than you are. The I mean, no matter what you try, your backup is going to be sitting in the wrong climate at some time. It's going to end up getting kicked over at some time. They, there may be some time in the future where, well, and in this case, for my dad, it was more convenient. He's got an external backup that I have him maintain. But because he's the one that's restoring his system and I'm not, 
it it much easier to just let it flow out of that cloud space, even more up to date than the last backup. The last backup could have been a week ago. The the last sync to the cloud space was just right before you was having problems. So yeah, it's that fortification that that is really what's going to protect you from the inconvenience of ransomware. Because I I doubt any of us are actually going to pay whatever the bill is. We're just going to be in a position where we're going to format the computer and try and recover as much data as possible. This leads into another topic that I do have on today's list about Windows 11. And this article is talking about how it's going to leave a lot of computers behind, which I still don't believe is going to be the case. For right now, I'll stick it in the chat room here if you're, you're interested. Uh, there, Microsoft is stating that Windows 11 will officially be supported on Intel 8th generation computers or newer. Uh, Zen 2 is the AMD uh, side of things. What this means is there's a whole slew of computers out there that are officially not compatible right now with Windows 11, including the computer I'm using and looking at. Another requirement is TPM2, Trusted Platform Module Version 2. And my computer, to give you a, a, a comparison, is a Gen 7, a 7th Gen Intel, and it supports TPM 1.2. And my manufacturer is ASUS, and I am not confident they're going to upgrade the firmware to TPM 2.0. So Windows 10 will probably be the last official, uh, officially supported Windows operating system on my laptop. Now I've, I'm surrounded by older uh, equipment like netbooks, a Lenovo over here that continue to run Windows 10, but they will not be looking at an official Windows 11 upgrade. The trusted platform module as well as things like the Rowhammer protection. You've probably heard of these, these CPUs that um, we've been using. Gosh, I don't even have the language in my head right now. You become an expert at this stuff for like 20 minutes and then you forget it all. There's a, an attack that allows you to get data out of the registry in a CPU. And it's because of the way that we've designed CPUs for the last 25, 30 years. And so Windows 11 is introducing, well, they actually introduced it in Windows 10, but it's not on by default, the ability to protect against these kinds of attacks. It's uh, a pre preemptive uh, uh, cache loading system that I'm sorry for the life of me, I cannot remember what we called it. Oh, but here's what Microsoft is calling it. Microsoft claims that a combination of Windows Hello, device encryption, virtualization-based security, and hypervisor-protected code integrity, that's got to be what I'm talking about, and secure boat, boot has been shown to reduce malware by 60%. So what they've done with Windows 11 is they have a talking points list of what they think is the reason that these threats are becoming so predominant in the, in the market. And they're ready to address each one of those points to reduce the amount of this malware, ransomware. So that's going to be their selling point with, with Windows 11. Is it's Well, and to be fair... I don't know if you've paid attention. We've talked about it throughout the years. Every release of Windows since Windows Vista has has a smaller systems requirement than the previous version. I, I don't know if you've paid that close of attention, but Windows Vista was such a fiasco when it was released because they lied about the system requirements. And places like Dell and HP released computers with Windows Vista that their 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 customer base was very unhappy with. 
It just left the sour stink on Windows Vista. Not not only that, Windows Vista was released early, before all the bugs were were. Um, well, it was probably the first real attempt by Microsoft to fix it later. Now the whole industry fixes things later, but this is the first large scale. We'll fix it later. And uh, and people just had horrible experiences with it, and so Windows. Windows 7 was Windows Vista, but they had lowered the system requirements. They pulled out all this graphics and special effects. They fixed the things that, that weren't working, and they called it Windows 7. And when they went to Windows 8, they did the same thing. They, they required even less processor, even less memory, and they were able to do it and still make a very pretty interface. Everybody hated Windows 8 for completely different reasons. And they fixed the Windows 8 hate reasons in Windows 8 1, but people were so soured on it, they stayed on Windows 7. And then finally, they released Windows 10, again, with even smaller system requirements. So even older computers could successfully run Windows 10. So this is the first time in four releases that, that Microsoft is saying, get a better computer. I don't think they have... They have said, get a better computer since Windows XP was released. Wow. Yeah. In Windows, Windows Vista, they should have said, get a better computer, but they didn't. They said, it'll be fine. So this is the first time when Windows, Windows XP was released, it's like, oh, yeah, you're going to have to buy that computer with that operating system because the Windows 95 computer, it's not going to run on the Windows 2000 computer. So that's that's what Windows 11 is going to be addressing is these kinds of issues, at least from a marketing perspective. Now, I said last week and the week before, I don't think these system requirements are going to stand. I think immediately you're going to have these unsupported installs of Windows 11 because there's all kinds of places where their workflows rely on computers that don't meet these system requirements. There's also a whole section of, of Windows PC gamers out there. And gamer motherboards typically don't worry about things like secure boot. They're, they're typically homemade computers. And they're very beefy computers that can handle any of these system requirements outside of the security restraints that Microsoft is arbitrarily putting on this operating system so that they could call it the most secure operating system they've ever made. And so I think that, the, that Microsoft's going to immediately have a Windows 11 that you can run at your own risk. No guarantee of the security on those platforms. At the, at the same time, I'm betting that they have Surface machines that are out there that are Gen 7 chips. They have a whole, um, a, a whole market of corporate users that have adopted to the Surface line of computers. Well, that's a Microsoft product. So they're going to have to sort that out with their sales reps and, and their corporate contracts because if they're forcing them to upgrade, which is what I think this really is, is this is one of those those wind tell pushes where they're 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 nudging people into new equipment so that they can push the market farther into the future. Uh, if they're asking their corporate customers to make those decisions, the fallout's going to be interesting to watch. I wonder how many will just stay with a sanctioned Windows 10 install versus versus upgrading their equipment, and I wonder if it'll it'll hurt their upgrade cycle. I, I, corporations have a tendency to get shy of buying from the same vendor if all of a sudden they're having to make decisions quickly. They kind of like to do the same thing over and over again. And that's definitely not what this is. Well, I put the link in the, uh, in the chat and I'll stick it on today's meeting notes. If you're interested in more information about both the hackers that have compromised a million devices and the Windows 11, 
one of these articles, I guess I didn't get the hacker's link in there. Let me put the hacker's link in there. I'm a big fan of the Verge podcast and their website for news. And uh, the Windows 10 article from the Ver Verge is really good. Have we got other topics? We are kind of whittling away our time. I have one more. Okay, and Jim. I have a uh, battery pack. I guess it's not going to show up. There we go. Um, for my uh, iPhone, and it has stopped charging. You know, it's one of those protective cover that has a built-in battery. Oh, yes. Okay. It will no longer charge. Uh, and I'm wondering if you have any suggestions. Did you say it's an iPhone? Yeah. Let's see if you can see this. Let me get rid of this uh, background. You look really spacey, Jim. Yeah, I'm going to try to. You and Paul are out of this world. I'm getting out of that. Come, back, come okay. down to Earth. I'll come down to Earth indeed. Well, I didn't. I thought I did. Anyway, can you see this at all? No. You might try pulling your screen forward a little bit. No, I, I'll figure out how to get it out. Don't worry about it. Uh, if I can get this off, I'll show you. If not, we'll do it next week. You have to put yeah, it in what, front of your face. Just say yeah. that again, Paul. Put it in front of your face. Oh. Phone face. Yeah, Perfect. there you go. That was a great suggestion. Yeah. So is this the case from Apple, or is this a third-party case? I think it's from Apple. Okay. You can see this so it, inside. That's the hole for the camera. This yeah. top comes off. Is is there play in the um, in the port in the firewire port or the, the I don't, lightning bolt port? I don't feel any play. So then, what I would think is just offhand. If it's your charging cables are working, yeah, is that correct. They are. You know, and if you I put the charging cable in, there is a ever so slight amount of play. Okay, but um, does it pass through? Does it charge the phone's battery, but not the additional battery, or does it not charge at all? Good question. Um, because what we're trying to determine sure. is where a bad connection may be. I'll tell you in just a second. Yeah, and so I would plug a charging cable into the phone without the case and verify that that's charging with no problems. Okay. And and as long as that's working with no problems, then you know it's not a phone problem. So after that, it's a case problem. Right, you are. And so the case problem can either be the jack that you're plugging it into to charge it or the lightning bolt connect connector that you're plugging into the phone. It's either, it's one of those ends. It's either the female end or the male end of the case. Right. And what we know about iPhones is that something that hurts the connection in those plugs in the orifice is dirt will get up in there and dust bunnies will get up in there and it will hurt the connector. The, the ability to get a connection. Right. And so if you're able to plug it in and neither the phone nor the case is charging, I would think the problem would be in that orifice. Okay, I just checked the cable and it works fine going to the phone directly, but it is not charging the phone when it is in the case. So, so what you're case saying- is the case isn't charging and the phone isn't charging. That is, is that correct. Okay. So I would suspect it's in the orifice there that's the problem. Right. But you also, the aura, and you would want to look physically at the, the that nub, that fire wire plug inside the case. Just make sure it's not corroded. Make sure that it's clean. You could use something like a, um, like like an alcohol 
But also, if you had any reason to think it had any oxidation, you might try using a little bit of vinegar and baking soda on it. Even even something like a fingerprint could cause you to have a bad connection yeah. if it had enough oil on it. Inside the plug or, oh, the, are the, uh, the, the... The part that plugs into your phone. Right, okay. Uh, yeah. All right, I, I try to clean that. Yeah, I mean, I think you can visually inspect it well enough to think that that's not the problem. So I'm more likely to believe it's the orifice on the other side. Yeah. And there's always the possibility that that orifice or the jack has has gotten fractured. But if I understand your case, I think you should be able to plug in the case independently and charge it. Uh, the answer is yes. I used to be able to do that. That's correct. And it, and that's not working right now. Is that no, correct? Not working right now. Yeah. So I really think it's in that orifice that's the problem. Oh. And now I have said the word orifice so many times it's uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but I understand. We lost and Bill I and Cheryl on that one. To, uh, to claim that the external piece with. Um, rubbing alcohol, or you say maybe some vinegar, but inside, what would I? Uh... No, no, just the opposite. The inside is where I would, I would wipe that, that connector. Okay. The, 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 the orifice, again, I'm still saying this word for lack of a better word. The, um, I, if you got a magnifying glass, I would look inside there and see if there isn't some kind of debris inside there. I'd be careful using a Q-tip. I mean, I would probably end up using a Q-tip. You know, sometimes I have to use a Q-tip for that kind of stuff. And I like to take off like 80% of the of the cotton because I don't want to accidentally get some cotton stuck on some connector and get it. I don't want to make it worse. Right. Right. But, but you, if it is oxidized, which... I don't expect to have a problem with, with a genuine Apple product, but if it is oxidized, then you're going to have to use something to, to, to clean that oxidation off of. And uh, so you're going to have to be able to get something up in there. And I'm, I always like to use alcohol first because the vinegar baking soda is a really aggressive way to clean oxidation. And it's just kind of like a last resort for me. I'd much rather use a pure alcohol, something that's at least 70% 70, 70 or more. Okay, I have it. Yeah. And and I would do it discreetly, as, as, as gently as possible. Being concerned you're leaving, like, like Q-tip up inside there. Yeah, that's what you want to avoid. Right. Is <laughs> making it worse. I have a question for you. Yeah, Fred. Uh, since we've orifice so many times, is uh, uh, YouTube going to get after you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there was Jim showing us his holes right there as I was talking. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Right in his face. <laughs> I think Cheryl left because she got sick of the dirty talk. Yeah, we, and, and we never did find it. I went and got my uh, my map. I wanted to know where uh, where Bill was driving there. That's true. Well, have we got any more topics? I I've got one that 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 hangs off of the Windows 11 topic. If you guys are interested, sure. Uh, one of the <laughs> things that Microsoft is trying to uh, sell you with the Windows 11 is a platform where you can install Android apps, which is the latest thing. People are finding they spend so much time on their tablets and phones that they, when they get on their desktop, they just want to be able to do that one thing that they've been doing with their phone. In fact, I, I'm a good example of this. Since I've been doing artwork for the uh, San Carlos Computer Club, I have an Instagram channel and I like to push out the uh, podcast artwork on the Instagram channel. And I would love to be able to sit here at my desk and do that. But every week, when I get everything else done, 
I have to sit on the couch with my phone and type up and copy and and download all from this five and a half inch or six inch device when it everything I want to do is right in front of me on a big screen. And I just want that one app. And so this was a great idea for and it was promised to us in Windows 10X, which is not being released now. And they're promising it to us in Windows 11 that we will be able to bring into the Windows Store all these these Android apps and be able to install these apps in, in our operating system. So, of course, Google, being in a constant battle with the powers that be, has now announced their change to the way that they're going to do apps. And they are going to switch from the traditional app bundle to a system called AAB. And a lot of us are thinking this is to stop Windows 10 from becoming the next Chromebooks in education. Because uh, the Chromebooks have this system in place already. You, you, you can see it on my kids' school computers. They are not limited by Chrome applications. They can install most Android applications that are out there. And Microsoft very, very creatively has made it possible to have both worlds. You can have your Android apps and your Windows applications running alongside it themselves, which is something that Google can't do because they're not a Windows-based computer. They're a Chrome-based computer. Right. But what what uh, they can do is they can change their requirements and the way that Android apps are being delivered to them. And because they are the biggest distributor of Android apps, it will directly shape the way this market goes forward. Uh, Android apps right now, you may have heard them referred to as APKs at some point. It's an Android package file. They're, they're, they're literally, if you were to download them on the internet, it would be some name of the program dot APK. And, and, and Google is changing their Google Play Store to support a newer generation of, of file distribution called AAB. In fact, I just had that in front of me. Android App Bundles. Dot AAB. And the way this technology would work and the way they're selling it is that you would only distribute those sections of an Android device or an Android application that are new. And an Android application fundamentally would be changed from an all-inclusive package that can be installed in your device to one that would be using dependence. And we've seen this in the Linux world forever, where you go to install a piece of software, and what it has is the core, but then to make the software work, there's all these, I'm making all these gestures to a camera that can't see me. You have the core, and then when you're doing the install, you have these dependents that are linked to the core, and so those dependents get included at that time of installation. So the core application may be very small, but then it's dependent on all these different pieces that are gathered from around the internet and put to the installation of the device you're installing them on. Now, the advantage of this is that those, those dependents can be updated independently. Another advantage to this is that your device may already have a number of those dependents already installed in it from previous installations of other applications. I, I hope this is all making sense. I'm trying to make it as straightforward as possible. By, by taking this new approach, they are trying to give you uh, more up-to-date, smaller packages to be installed. But the second, I mean, that's what they're saying. But the secondary effect is Apple, um, 
I said Apple by accident. Apple's already done this with their stuff in the M1 chip. Uh, the secondary effects on Microsoft is that this plan with Windows 10 to be able to run Android applications is going to be directly impacted by this. Because this is such a small niche right now for the Windows 10, the Windows 11 installations, and such a large player in the way things are done on the Android Google side of things. Google is making a move that's very Apple-ish in that they can just change this whole marketplace and all their developers will follow suit because that's where all their money is, is over in that area, not this niche area that, that Microsoft is creating right now, but in this overall, this 90% this of what they're doing, this overarching area, they will change the way that they build and distribute apps to match that. And Microsoft is going to be playing catch up, may even be dealing with licensing agreements. They may even be dealing with, with hosting their own versions of this software so they can even catch up with what, what um, Google can metaphorically just flip a switch on in, in a very Apple kind of way of doing things. So it, the article is very interesting. It comes back to a theme that we see over and over again throughout the years as a computer club. Uh, I get very frustrated when, when we're doing things not because it's the right technology decision, but it's the right business decision. And I'll leave it for you guys to figure out whether the, what this is, because some of those... Uh, some of those concepts that Google is trying to sell with this idea are, are genuine and, and, and uh, reasonable reasons to change the way that they're doing these things. But it also feels very well-timed to kind of deflate that section of the Windows 11 announcement. I, I, I hope people understand what I was talking about. Well... That's always my goal. <laughs> my, my goal is to take something that's 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 a bit confusing and try and make it a bit less confusing. <laughs> well, Cheryl's gone. I had a, I, I, you know what? I'm going to save this for next week because I'd like to hear her talk about her opinions on biohackers making insulin 98% cheaper. You can find it in the art in the article list that I that that I passed around last night. I'm going to leave it on the list for next week because I'd like to hear her insight on it. She has been our resident insulin expert, you know, sharing with us her experiences with the technology and and the policies there in Canada. And I'm just curious how this will go down from her eyes. Uh, and let's see, do I have anything else? There's a one-off. Google must face voice assistant privacy lawsuit. Not a lot of news in this. It basically, it's just an update that uh, Google has been in front of a, a Supreme Court trying to determine whether they even need to, need to be part of the lawsuit, whether it can be disregarded. And a federal judge has said, no, uh, you can't get out of it. We're going to have this case. And so that's what this article is about on NBC, that uh, a federal judge has said Google must face the lawsuit. And this is a lawsuit that's all about illegal, illegally recording and sharing uh, private information. It's very specifically written for those times that Google Assistant would go off by accident in your pocket on your phone. And those recordings they are proving have been collected, stored, and distributed. And, and you know it's not for malicious intent, intentionally malicious intent. They've just been using those recordings to help train their algorithm. This is a lawsuit against that they think the uh, the lawsuit is they should not be using these recordings for anything 
They shouldn't have been recorded in the first place. They shouldn't be used for anything in the first place because they're accidental. And we're going to see a lot more of these kinds of lawsuits going forward because these kinds of technologies, we have no paradigm. We're kind of like, we're kind of like rats in a maze and the maze is being built before our eyes. We're trying to decide with legislation what our community is going to tolerate. I don't know if uh, winning or losing this lawsuit makes better technology or worse. I think that's the reason the lawsuit must go forward is because I don't know whether it's better or not. that the we, uh, I don't think, have a good understanding of what's... How have I lost? It's a good thing I'm not chewing gum at the same time as talking and, and running this meeting. There we go. That link is in today's meet notes if you're interested, and also from the document that I shared last night. Uh, we need to start... Um, tapering out our meeting, but we always try and have a section of recommendations. And I will open that up now because we are running out of time. And I'm very interested in, and I'll mention again, shows, movies, as well as applications, books, podcasts, or websites that you guys have found useful and inter interesting that you think should be shared with the rest of us. This is the time to do it. I see there's just the six of us left. Does anybody have anything on their list that they'd like to share with everybody else? I saw an interesting movie the other night. It was called The Dig, and I think it was on Netflix. Um, and it's, it's a movie. Yes, it was. And it was uh, Carrie Mulligan and... Uh, Ray Fiennes, uh, and it was about a woman who had an estate in England with a couple of burial mounds, and she hired this local guy with no particular education, but other than that handed down by his father and his grandfather, they were experienced in digging up these kinds of burial graves, and they found a ship from uh, the Anglo-Saxon period. And I won't say anything more, but it was really a fun movie and how the British Museum got involved and wanted to dismiss the uh, excavator, even though it was his discovery. So I would, uh, I would recommend that one. Awesome. I, I heard something about it, but you've given me enough information. I hadn't been paying any attention to it. You've given me enough information that now I want to go watch it. Yeah, you'll enjoy it, especially if you're a history buff. You know, on a side note, I just caught some headlines just recently about the British Museum giving back artifacts to some, yeah. I think, it was it, I want to say Latin American company, uh, country. But I can't remember which one it was, but it was big news. <laughs> I, or I'm history buffs, I'm imagining. Do we have any other recommendations out there? Gosh, I feel like I just watched something. What did I just watch? I just watched a good movie, uh, No Sudden Moves, with uh, Del Toro and uh, Don Cheadle. Wow. It's uh, it's kind of a heist movie. These guys that are kind of screw up criminals get hired to cover some play, and they're basically watching this guy's family. And what it's all about is um, the cover up on the catalytic converters and the exhaust problems with automobiles back oh, in really? the fifties. Yeah, no, it's, oh, it's an amazing movie. And there's just so many twists and turns in it. It's really hard to follow how it all works out. But <laughs> it, it was a great motor conspiracy from the 60s and 70s, right? Well, the 50s. 50s. It started in the 50s. 
um, they basically are, they're trying to steal these documents from this uh, lawyer's safe and they kidnap this manager's family, basically come in in the morning while they're all getting ready to go about their day. And one of the guys takes him to the office to go steal these papers out of the boss's safe while the rest of them hold the family. And oh, it's oh, a, don't spoil it. I'm going to go watch that. Yeah, I got yeah, two new movies. You, you want to go watch that? That's a, it's a really good movie. What was the name? I think Sid said it's no, no sudden, sudden move. No sudden move. What'd you watch it on, Sid? Amazon. Oh, great. A fine movie. Got it. I think it was Amazon. I forgot. Me and Justin were watching it. I'm trying to bring up my, my track. Oh, sorry. Trying to bring up my track list because I'm sure I watched something recently. I feel like there was something specific that I wanted to recommend, and now I can't. It's just, Follow it's, down, of course, I didn't write it down. Oh, uh, I, I know what watching it was. Season it wasn't a movie. Of, uh, Godfather of Home. Say that again, Sid. I started watching season two of Godfather of Harlem. That was oh, yeah. season one was is great. I mean, they stuck to the history and everything on that. It's uh, the mob involvement in Harlem in the uh, '60s, and they've just got in in season two. Right off the bat, they get into the French Connection. Oh, between uh, Marseille and the mob and the heroin trade, right? Yeah, it's it's already starting out really good, and they get and it gets really in depth with the involvement with Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali. Oh wow! Ooh. Yeah. Now that sounds good too. You guys are. Uh... Yeah, they also get into a little how uh, civil rights were handled in Harlem back then. It's. The series has been written. Up season my list. one was really good. <laughs> but yeah, well, season I, one was really good. Season two starting out really song on that. I just remembered what it was I was gonna gonna recommend. It wasn't a movie, it was a podcast. And I've I've mentioned it before. It is um, Land of the Giants. And their new season, their, their previous seasons, they went through how did Amazon get so big? How did how did Google get so important? So they've got a couple of different seasons under their belt already. And I haven't gotten through all of them, but I've really enjoyed the ones that I, the Amazon one was amazing. The Google stuff is amazing. This latest season, they've dedicated to uh, delivery, restaurant delivery services, like DoorDash and Grubhub and Uber Eats. And it goes through the history of those services and brings it up to the pandemic and how the pandemic changed everything about those markets. And so I'm not, I don't think I'm quite done with this season, but this season's dedicated to this. I've already listened to the first two episodes and it's just been fascinating to find out the difference in business practices, employees or contract workers, like independent workers or employees, how they would pay, whether it was based on a job, whether it was based on employment contract, the the way they modeled their business, whether they they made deals with restaurants to be the delivery service, or or there was I mean what we're watching right now is real guerrilla tactics in the in that market where these, these, these IT businesses, these tech businesses have taken the menus without authorization from these businesses and put them into their platform and offered them as deliverable goods through their platform without any kind of authorization from the businesses and services that are, that are providing those goods. So they've, they've 
put themselves, they wiggled themselves right into a middleman position so that every transaction of delivery, they're the ones that are taking the delivery from both the service provider and the customer. And, and they get in depth into some of the issues that they're dealing with, things like uh, the product that's being ordered might not be available, but the service providing it doesn't know that because they don't have a relationship with the restaurant or service. So maybe there's, they use the example of things, and I, this isn't the example, but I'll, I'll, this one's an easy one for me. You order a shamrock shake from McDonald's. Well, that's only available during St. Patrick's Day, and you're trying to order it in, in, in June. So the customer is gonna be unhappy because they can't provide the product. They might write a bad review about the service. I mean, granted, my example is McDonald's, so they're probably ready for that. But they're getting a bad review and they're getting ticked because of something that's beyond their control. It's been offered out of season. If they had a relationship with McDonald's, they would know that. So they're kind of hurting, in my example, they're hurting McDonald's um, standing. Maybe my, my example isn't the best example because I could really care less whether McDonald's is hurt or not. Let's call it mom and pop shake shop around the corner. It's being offered out of season. And if they had a relationship with the delivery service, the delivery service would know that and not make it available to their customers. But because they've taken this gorilla approach to doing business, the businesses they're doing with don't even realize it's a delivery service when they're making the orders. They may not even know until they show up to pick up the order. So it's just fascinating that how that business has changed in the last year dramatically, how it grew in, in, in its beginnings. I, I think they used Grubhub as an example of a service that has been around since the early 2000s. The, that, I mean, I was never aware of that, but I lived in Anchorage, Alaska, so we didn't have any of these. These kinds of services go way back into the dot-com day and age where these would be rolled out in places like New York or San Francisco or Seattle, where there's a huge market that could immediately be taking advantage of them. Uh, Grubhub, I think, from the history I learned from the podcast, started out from a web browser. Like If you wanted to order food in New York from a pizzeria around the corner, you would have to go to a web page, look at that up put your credit card number or have some kind of billing into a web browser, click a link, that would be sent off as an email. So they go into all of that kind of stuff and where we are right now. And one of the things I found fascinating was that they had interviews with Grubhub changing their approach because they had to survive in this marketplace. They had to take the, the, the guerrilla tactic approach of unauthorized distribution of, of goods for sale because the other guy was doing it and killing them with it. So anyway, that is Land of the Giants. And if you have any interest in that, those kinds of th these, these tech companies, their growth, their history, where they are right now, I think it's great to know this stuff because like government typically does, they're behind the curve. So we're making regulations now for things that probably should have been regulated 10 years ago. It's good to, good to have this information in the background as you're forming opinions on what should be regulated. Are these podcasts all about a standard length, like a half hour or one hour or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. It seems like the ones I've been listening to are like a half hour to 45 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, something something in that that amount, but it's totally worth it. Really good information. If I'm remembering right, it's done by The Verge as well. They have they have a whole section of different podcasts they do, and I think Land of the Giants is a Ver Verge podcast. Have we got any other recommendation? It can be anything, even a helpful website that you found recently. 
that we could all take advantage of. Hmm. Nothing's being shouted out there. I think we are reaching the end of this week's computer club meeting. Have I forgotten anything that we should be talking about? I am just updating my notes as we're talking. We're going to do a follow-up with Judy next week to see if she's actually gotten her Simply Safe unboxed and going forward with that. And we will do the insulin next week, too, so we can get Cheryl's input on some of this stuff. I guess I could say, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, I'm still at only 34, and I want 100. <laughs> I'll mention that again. Sid, tell your whole department to subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't listen to me. Yeah, they don't care. Nobody cares. Tell them tell them not to then. Yeah. Yeah, let's use that on them. <laughs> whatever whatever you do, don't don't uh don't subscribe. Don't yeah, subscribe like I said, they don't listen to me on anything. <laughs> Well, I guess we have reached the end of our meeting. If we've run out of topics, run out of recommendations, and run out of time, it's time to go. <laughs> it's, we've run out. We've run Take out. Take care, everybody. Au, au revoir. Stay safe, You everyone. guys have an awesome week. I always enjoy meeting with you, so we'll be back. Oh, wait. You know what we didn't talk about is I'm going to Alaska. Ooh. Let me see what... We'll see what the next meeting I'm involved in, if my calendar will open. Come on, calendar. Sid's all excited. We're all excited. I think I am traveling on the day of the next computer club, so I may not be here next week. So I think you guys are on your own again to have a meeting. I will put out the announcements. I will get all set up as though I'm in a position to record it, but I don't even think I'll be in a position to record it. I think I'll actually be in a car driving up during the meeting. So I don't know if I'll have any ability to participate in the meeting. Well, it is a fabulous drive, so enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Are you going to take will, the whole family up there? Well, you know what? Because of the inconvenience of having to fly Yuya out of here, because she's Mexican, she can't cross the land border. Apparently, that's not going to be available until around September. And so hmm. we would have to fly her out of here. And she's also got some steady work here during the summer. So I'm taking the kids with me. The three of us are going to go up for a month, and Yuya is just going to stay behind and, and do her thing. So I don't know. I might might try and work out somebody. Maybe you could leave one of the girls record, but... to record. Right. <laughs> well, they'll be in the car, so that's not. Gonna I know. Work. I know, but I can't. That might not work. I don't know. I've got a week to figure it out. Otherwise, you guys can just meet without me. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, until right. Goodbye, next everybody. time. Say again, Jim. Said yeah. goodbye, Jim. Just au revoir. Right. Adios. Until next week or the week after, I should be set up. You guys have a wonderful, awesome week. And tech on. Bye bye. Later. Adios, everybody. Sydney, talk to you later. Dave, talk to you next yeah. week or the next week right, after that. Easy, Scott. Later. And that has been the San Carlos Computer Club. We meet each week on Tuesdays at 10 and discuss tech topics that matter to us because that's all that matters. And if you're looking for computer help out there on the internet, I hope you get a hold of me. International Computer Solutions, that's internationalcs.net. You can reach me directly, scott at internationalcs.net. If you're looking for remote help, you can also use remote at internationalcs.net. Come back to our website for the Computer Club to find recordings and podcasts of these meetings. It's sccclub.org. We also got Twitter and Instagram. You can look for us in those respected places. 
Until next week, tech on. I hope you have an awesome week. We'll talk to you then. Adios.